Hey everybody, welcome to the Wonderful World of Remnant Radio. In today's program, we're going to be discussing demonology and the various views of demonology in the charismatic movement and throughout Christian history. It's going to be an exciting program. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a show where we tackle history, theology, and the gifts of the Spirit. My name is Joshua Lewis. I'm the pastor of King's Fellowship in Ada, Oklahoma, together with my friends Michael Miller at Reclamation Church Denver and Michael Roundtree at Bridgeway Church OKC. We set aside time every week to discuss the gifts of the Spirit. Things like, how should we pray for the sick? And and how do we interpret tongues? And should we believe all the prophetic words for the new year? If you're looking for a charismatic podcast with practitioners who are actually doing the stuff, this is the show for you. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to this program of Remnant Radio. It's exciting uh, for me to be back here in the studio. Just spent a week in Breckenridge, Colorado with the family. I get to hang out with Michael Miller and his church got to preach there. It was a lot of fun, Uh, but I'm back in the saddle jumping into the demonology stuff. So if you guys are new to the channel, I'd encourage you to subscribe, hit the like button if you like this video, share it around if it's been beneficial to you. And if you want to support the channel because we create content like this every single week, uh, there are ways to do that in the description of the video. Your first link is for PayPal and your second link is for Patreon. If you give on Patreon, you can give as low as five bucks a month and get access to a little bit of extra content. Uh, Like one of the things that we're doing right now is we're doing a prayer meeting where we're gathering together and praying for the new conference that's coming up uh, September 14th through the 16th. It's the Prophecy and Hearing God Conference. And it's going to be held at Oklahoma City uh, there at Bridgeway Church, Michael Roundtree's church. We have uh, just a couple hundred seats left, so if you're interested in joining us for that, you can also find the link in the description of the video, or you can check out remnantconferences.com. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to the fellas. Fellas, how are you guys doing uh, over there in doing Oklahoma and Denver? Yeah. Doing good. Yeah. I don't think we have a couple hundred seats left. I think we have like... Mm, a little over a hundred is my reflection, but yeah. either way, one fifty, yeah, maybe. Anyway, uh, neither here nor there. Definitely want to sign up for that. It's going to be a great conference. Uh, yeah, doing good over here uh, in in the Oklahoma. How about you in Colorado, Miller? Man, I'm doing good. I got to do. One of our elders got married. I got to do the ceremony, and uh, he married. I would say the very first member of our church, and so uh, that that was a lot of fun, man. Uh, I cried a lot and got nervous because I kept crying <laughs> and losing my place yeah. in the wedding. Uh, well, but it was a really uh, wonderful a lot. event. So I do. <laughs> a bit of baby. <laughs> so that's not okay. a here or there. Thanks for that. Yeah. So talking a little bit about demons or as Josh likes to say, devils. Devils. So, uh, so Miller, I know you kind of uh, – you kind of put together some notes for this show. So why don't you lead us through? Yeah, sure. So my hope was to talk about the uh, various contemporary views of, of Christian possession. Like, can a Christian be demonized? Now, those of us on the show, we've all been of the persuasion that, yes, a Christian can have a demon. Um, but that has not been the popular opinion amongst evangelicals and even some of the charismatic movement. And so I wanted to present their positions and offer some rebuttals and then talk through some of the early church fathers, specifically the Antinician fathers. And maybe one day we'll get to some of the post Nicene uh, fathers as well. Um, but the first one I wanted to chat about was that of um, Chuck Smith now and Calvary Chapel in general. Now, just to, to preface here, um, I, I don't know about you guys, I used to read all the commentaries. Anytime I would go through a book of the Bible, I would get on the uh, Blue Letter Bible page and look at all the notes of Chuck Smith's anytime he preached through uh, a various book of the Bible because his notes were so helpful. His sermons were so helpful. He went line by line, uh, book by book, through every book of the Bible in his tenure as a uh, pastor and teacher in the body of Christ. And so uh, I've always found him to be incredibly valuable. I love the history there with the Jesus People Movement. Many of you may have seen the Jesus Revolution. Uh, but I do disagree with him on his position on demonization. And so I thought it'd be worthwhile to talk about it. And again, this is one of those like tertiary disagreements. So I think it's an important one. Um, what about you guys? Did you ever study any of the Chuck Smith stuff or know much about his history and what his contribution to Christ, the body of Christ was? I mean, yeah, I, like you, have... Uh perused through his writings on the Bible, um, like more almost like commentary style. And so I, I found it to be pretty helpful and uh, read some of his stuff on end times, but I, I read a, a, a lot of books on that kind of deal. So uh, yeah, so I've, I've read a pretty fair amount of, of his stuff and 
Uh, I know he made some great contributions to the body of Christ. I, I've read absolutely none of his stuff, um, but I would say that I've <laughs> been affected by people who who were affected by Chuck. So uh, I think one of the most popular Christian YouTubers right now is a guy named Mike Winger. Uh, Mike comes out of the Calvary Chapel movement. You know, I, I go and preach. Miller, you and I both go and preach at Calvary Chapel, Oro Valley, there in Arizona. Um, you know, so we, I, I love uh, that Calvary Chapel space. I know that he was a guy that was one of the first to be charismatic and then want things to be done decently and in order. Um, you know, my, my friend Jack Coltish is also a Calvary Chapel guy from, from his background. So I, I think of all of these kinds of, uh, you know, believers, brothers and sisters that I'm uh, doing ministry alongside. And they're still carrying along that kind of ministry of like, hey, let's let's do the gifts, let's believe in these things, but let's also make sure that they're done in a biblically prescribed way. So I don't have anything but positive things to say about the guy and the ripples of his ministry, as I've seen those kind of ripple effects uh, in my own personal life and in, in, in space. But but I don't know the guy very well, uh, nor his teachings or videos or anything like that. Yeah, well, his his particular position on Christian possession is what I would think the wider evangelical movement's position is on. Christian possession. Even though he was a continuationist, I would say his church, by and large, when it comes to the gifts, it seems to function like a conservative evangelical who's got a sort of passive approach to the gifts. Uh, and I don't want to misrepresent them in any way at all. I really do uh, want to rightly represent it. But what I've done is I've collected a couple of quotations, one of them being from just a Calvary Church uh, webpage, um, one particular church's webpage where they talk about it, and then also a quote from Chuck Smith in his sermon that series that he did in Mark, and then a we've got, actually got an audio clip from a sermon series he did in Luke. So let's start with the first one. Josh, you want to take that one away? Reject the belief uh, held by Pentecostals and Charismatics that the Christians can be demon-possessed. The scripture says, uh, greater is he that is in you than he is in the world, which makes no sense uh, if both the Holy Spirit and an evil spirit can simultaneously indwell a believer. Christians can be attacked and externally oppressed by demons, but cannot possess, uh, cannot be possessed and controlled by them. Okay. Yeah, it seems to me like the uh, typical oppression, Christians can't be possessed, but can be oppressed. Um, which again, I, that was my Bible church. Michael, you went to, uh, was it a Baptist church in college, right? When you became a Christian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. Was this sort of yeah. their position as well? <laughs> their, their position was, we don't talk about this. <laughs> So I went there four years and no one ever talked about demonization uh, at all. So I don't actually know what their position was. I know that uh, when I first started exploring a little bit of gifts of the spirit stuff, uh, there was a lot of caution expressed toward me. And then whenever it, it like the rumor spread that I had graduated college and joined Jack Deere's church, people, some people were like, Oh, what are you doing? You know, so uh, so I imagined that uh, there's probably just kind of a non-position and and a simple assumption that Christians can't be demon uh, demonized, and that probably if it ever happens, it's somewhere in Africa where there's a witch doctor or something like that. But certainly, no one's ever put any sort of like theological language to a position, uh, at least that I encountered at that church. But it was a very awesome church that really blessed me and uh, and all those things. But demonization was just not a conversation. It was definitely the position of my church. I mean, I grew up in the assemblies and every assemblies of God church, they hold the 16 fundamentals. And there are position papers. I think we're actually going to read one later uh, on d the demonic. Uh, but generally, the Assemblies of God, they will agree to those 16 fundamentals, and then they'll have varying positions within their movement. Like they'll, Some will run their church on apostles and prophets, and others completely reject that kind of notion of hierarchical systems. So the, the denomination as a whole only really has you know, these core 16 areas that there has to be agreement on. And then there's a lot of like, hey, this is the position of the denomination, but each local church is going to have a different belief system when it comes to these things. Uh, the Bible school that I went to, the church that I went to, that was something that was constantly pushed was that you can be oppressed by a demon. Uh, you can have, you know, temptations, you, you know, those kinds of, but you can't have oppression. And, and I would even say that when... You mean possession. possession. You right? can't have yeah, possession. Yeah, oppression, but not possession. But what's difficult about that is like, I would even think in terms of like sickness being an oppression of the demonic, right? However, uh, I don't think that we believed in taught. I couldn't. I can't quote anything. I don't think we believed in taught that you could have a sickness that is a result of a demonic attack either. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's it seems something that I'm quite familiar with. 
Yeah. So, okay. Let me just read this next quote from, this is from Chuck Smith himself. And then let's play the audio clip because he's going to describe what he means by oppression and how, how demonic, how the demonic interacts with the light within the life of the believer. And it is slightly different than what we're going to see with AG. Uh, AG will say similar kind of language about oppression and possession. Um, though they allow a bit more room on the oppression side for a person who's a Christian to be even more afflicted or oppressed, so to speak. So here's the Chuck Smith uh, quote from his sermon series on Mark 9. He says, one night I'm going to talk about demonology. I don't want to get into it tonight. It's a subject I really don't like to talk about, but we probably should know about it. Fortunately, here in the United States, there is not really much true demon possession. There's a lot of imagined demon possession, but not much true demon possession. All kinds of demon oppression. I mean, as a child of God, you're wrestling against these principalities and powers. We are in spiritual warfare, but because the strong Christian influence, we do not see much actual demon possession here. Not nearly as much as you might see when you go to some of the pagan foreign countries where the light of the gospel does not shine bright. There you see actual cases of demon possession, many of them. Uh, and we are seeing more here as the occult and the Eastern mystic religions are developing and growing in the United States. We are beginning to see more demon possession. And as a result of that, I will be talking about it some night, but I don't really want to get into it tonight. So we're, we're going to talk about when he does get into it in Luke. But just right off the bat, what do you guys think about the fact that he says we don't see much of that in the United States? And that was probably I mean, this was uh, I don't know when this sermon series was. My guess was in the 70s. What, what do you guys think about that? I mean, I I like when having our conversations with Elijah on the the series that we did on um, like the kind of Halloween series that we did talking about the uh, spooky evangelism, it, spooky evangelism. Yeah, we we're talking about evangelizing to New Age and occult and Wicca, those kinds of things. And we were discussing this. He just kept using this phrase "magic blindness" and how the West is just so blind to the concept of magic and and mysticism and Eastern thought. And, you know, polytheism, like when, when someone in the West, generally speaking, and, and this is probably dying out, won't be the case forever. And if it's, it might not be the case anymore at all. Uh, but when people say God, people typically think of monotheistic, you know, one divine being all, all powerful, all knowing, you know, uh, omnipotent, those, those kinds of things, those kinds of divine attributes. Whereas throughout history, when you say the word God, it's just general. And people would be like, what God, which God? You know, uh, one of many, that kind of thing. That's the conceptualization of God. Um, and because Christianity had been so pervasive here in the West and, you know, as it formed our governments and our education systems, you know, and, and Christianity was viewed as, as kind of a respectful religion for such a long time, and it took the forefront. Um, I would say that those other worldviews were then kind of kind of critiqued as mythology. You know, like when we talk about mythology, we think of like this make-believe stories that, you know, that teach parables and lessons, but that aren't real, that don't have any tangibleness to them. However, I think Christians throughout history would not have conceptualized that. They would say, no, these are really systems of worship and there are real demons behind these stories and there's really principalities and powers that are influencing and empowering these things whereas most of us westerners would just would be completely magic blind if you will to the idea of a spiritual force empowering a religion a spiritual force empowering an individual demonically uh, for for nefarious purposes so um i think chuck smith is probably just kind of falling into that same kind of western a uh, uh, slippery slope, if you will, that, that we just assume that there's not demonic activity that's taking place here. Uh, and yet, you know, we see it all throughout Jesus and the apostles' ministry. Uh, and I think that as sin is ramping up here in the West, uh, I think that the demonic activity is probably ramping up along with it. Um, anyway, those are my thoughts. Roundtree? Yeah. yeah, I just am not sure that it follows that because we had a decent number of Christians in our country that therefore people wouldn't be demonized. I mean, I would want like a chapter and verse for that. Um, I'm just thinking about ancient Israel, like, and particularly he makes the case like over against like, uh, you know, paganism, occultism, those kind of things. Uh, I, I look at uh, Jerusalem in the first century and Jerusalem, I mean, it was very Jewish. They worshiped Yahweh. They went to synagogue. It was a very religious culture. It was monotheistic. Uh, there weren't witch doctors in town. They weren't casting spells on each other. Uh, there, it was certainly, it was part of the Roman Empire. So you would have had some Romans there and some, you know, and some of that pagan 
is pagan influence and that sort of thing. Uh, but on a scale, it would be nothing like when you went to Ephesus. It would be nothing like uh, when you went to some of these other cities. So, uh, and so I look at that and Jesus in Jerusalem and around Israel and Jewish lands where Yahweh uh, was openly professed, Jesus casting out demons left and right. Doesn't seem to be any sort of problem with him coming across demons, demons that are manifesting and him addressing it. So I would say that just because culturally there is a one God that is worshiped uh, and culturally just because paganism and witchcraft and the occult are, are not kind of mainstream. Like, I don't think that's the necessity for lots of demonization to be experienced. I don't see that in the scripture. And I look at, uh, take an old Testament example, uh, Saul, who openly professed Yahweh. Yeah, he had he did have a run in with the witch, but that was later, 1 Samuel 28. But in 1 Samuel 16 is the first moment that an evil spirit comes upon him. And uh, and this is somebody that, again, openly professes Yahweh in a culture where Yahweh is proclaimed and so on. And he gets radically demonized. Why? Well, you find out in 1 Samuel 18, 9 and 10. And the reason is that Saul turns a jealous eye toward David. So I would make the case that sin is what opens the doors to demons. And uh, and he seems to make the case that only the occult, like a, a similar case, but the only open door he sees is the occult. And I would say you're underestimating the devil if you think that's his only like parlor trick there. It, devil has a lot of tricks in his arsenal and he'll get in through any sin whatsoever. When I teach on demonization, I'll one of the things I'll do is I'll walk through the armor of God and I'll say that anywhere that we have a hole in our armor subjects ourselves to demonic forces. And so whether that be the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of the hope of salvation, the shield of faith, uh, etc. And so I would say that sin generally is the open door not just the occult, number one, and number two, not just what the national culture seems to be and support, um, because more important than that is, am I walking in holiness? Am I walking with Jesus? Am I wearing the full armor of God? And if so, I'm protected from demonization. Uh, and, and so that's how I would kind of think through that one. Brian Tree, would you think that, do you think that that could be because my, my perception of it was that that the Western, the culture of Westernization had caused him to have magic blindness is I think the way that I articulated it. But like, so I, I'm not even saying that stuff's not there, but that he couldn't perceive it. Do you think that would be a fair assessment, though, I, to I say that like, because I agree with you, I, I think that demonic activity loves when people look Christian and are bound up in sin at home, right? Like they look externally good, like the Pharisees in the temple, they look like another Pharisee, but when Jesus enters, like real power shows up, they're manifesting demons, don't come and torment us before our time, that kind of thing. So like, do, do you think that um, what Chuck Smith, Smith is experiencing, his assumption that because we have a Western worldview, because we're a Christian nation, we don't see that kind of demonic activity, do you think that that kind of blindness is probably affecting many Christians like so do you, do you think I, it can be a both hand? yes there is demonic attack and there's real blindness uh yeah I do I I 100 percent. so I wasn't trying to contradict you in that uh so I I definitely agree and I think there's harmony between what we're saying and uh and I would say I, I mean I'm gonna be honest I like Chuck Smith I think he was a, a really great bible teacher who did a lot of great things for the body of Christ to me this feels a little bit ethnocentric I'm just going to That's what I was going to say. It feels a little bit like, well, we in the West, we've got the Judeo-Christian values and we got, you know, we kind of got it together. So we're protected from like all the real bad devil stuff. And, uh, and you know, those, those other cultures over there, they're the ones that are really subject. I, yeah, I don't see it. I, I don't. And I, it's not just that I don't see it. I, I think that, um, and I'm not, I'm certainly not calling him like, you know, I'm not calling him like racist or something like that. I, I, I'm just simply saying, I, I'm using a broader word, ethnocentric, to say it's uh, just a little bit like having trouble seeing beyond one's own culture and thinking one's own culture, speaking beyond skin color, one's own culture is superior. It kind of, I, I think, 
touches on that a little bit. So that's another reason I don't love that quote. Yeah, I was going to say similarly about the ethnocentric approach to this. Uh, he he very much has the Western rationalistic French Enlightenment influence playing into his perception of the American culture. But on top of that, I think um, when you Josh, you mentioned magic blindness. I actually think that our culture by and large and, and me uh, coming from the Bible church, when I became a Christian at 15, all the churches I went to were Dallas Theological Seminary led. You know, in other words, there was a pastor who graduated from DTS, got his either master's or doctorate, whatever from from DTS. And in those churches, it was the same kind of blindness. Like you, the we would talk about the oppression that would sort of come from outside, and we'll, we'll get into that in the next quote. But um, by and large, I think the devil in, in the Western culture is hidden in plain sight. We're so used to just seeing the world around us that that we can't see that there's something demonic behind a lot of what is being orchestrated both in believers and unbelievers lives and i don't think we uh, by and large have been taught how to cast out demons that's not been a part of our world view and so we're we're quite blinded to the supernatural world in a general sense not just magic per se uh, but but supernatural blindness um, but let's read this next quote or let, let's play this next uh, uh voice clip of him actually explaining a little bit more about what oppression is. He re-emphasizes his position, but then talks somewhat about oppression. Maladies and powers. They can oppress the child of God. They can harass the child of God. They can make you feel miserable. They can make you feel sick and logy. They can make you feel depressed. They can fill you with anxiety. But I do not believe that there is any basis in the scriptures to believe that they can actually possess the child of God. Though they may oppress you, they work from the outside. They cannot come in and possess you because what fellowship hath light with darkness? What concourse hath Christ with Belial? But even from the outside, they can do a pretty thorough job of making life miserable for the child of God. And we are told in the epistle of James, that we should resist the devil and he will flee from us and we are to draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to us. Many times as we are engaged in a warfare against these spirit forces, one of the problems is our failure to recognize the source of our problem. We are so prone to think, man, I just feel horrible today. Man, do I feel miserable. You know, we're just grumped at everything and everybody. Not recognizing that it's a spiritual warfare. And because of our attitudes, we get everybody on edge around us. We can stir up the whole family. We can get everybody sharp-tongued and cutting each other, you know, because of our miserable attitude, because we are being spiritually harassed by these. I cut the clip a little too early. Okay. He's going to say these demons or spirits. So <laughs> I'll have to in post add the rest of that clip. Um, you know, I think he is using this, this, uh, this quote in 2 Corinthians uh, six about Christ not having fellowship with, you know, these other spirits, these demonic powers. But I think he's kind of reading it. And I don't, I don't, again, Chuck Smith is a, is a brilliant pastor. I'm not trying to like throw shade. I think he's reading it incorrectly. I think it would be the equivalent of me saying on a Sunday morning, you know, uh, Christians don't get divorced. Christians ought not to get divorced. You know, what business does a Christian have getting a divorce? Does that mean that Christians can't get divorced? Well, no, actually we see Christians get divorced all the time. Uh, they have faith in Jesus. They believe in him as their savior and their Lord. Uh, but it's a principle that, that something ought not to be done. That's the way that I'm, I'm speaking of it. You know, you ought not to get a divorce. Uh, and obviously there are biblical grounds for this. This episode's not on divorce. So, you know, watch another video that we've done on, with David and Stone Brewer on that if you're interested. Um, but but on, on that conversation to say, you can make a statement, this ought not be the case, uh, and it, 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 sh it will not happen, it cannot happen as, as, a, as a way of um, making a moral inflection and a moral statement rather than saying it's an impossibility. Um, because again, I, I'm reminded of you, Peter, right? Um, who, who do you say that I am? You know, uh, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, Peter. My Father in heaven has revealed it to you, right? And then he comes back and then he tells the disciples that he's going to have to go to the cross and die. And Peter says, hey, never, may, may it never be. And he says, get behind me, Satan. So he went from the Spirit of God revealed this to you to 
the demonic power has has deceived you into thinking that you can convince me out of going to the cross. So in one moment, Peter is filled with the spirit of the Lord and then filled with another spirit that is anti-Christ. Um, so in that moment, if you will, um, both are influencing this man, Peter, which I think is what Chuck is saying should not be done, cannot be done. But but maybe I'm making more of his point than, than he is saying because he's talking in terms of oppression and possession. Uh, Miller, do you want to weigh in on any of that? Uh, sure. I just want to summarize sort of what he said is he, he sort of labels oppression as uh, it can cause you to be depressed. It can cause you to be anxious. It can even cause you to experience sicknes, but he doesn't elaborate on what sicknesses qualify as demonic in nature. And he doesn't really, again, I, I think, you know, there's probably sermons that he has out there. I haven't found them yet where he talks in more detail about uh, what oppression is and how a person could get oppressed and, you know, what you can do to off or, or, or fight against uh, these kinds of oppressions. But the point that I'm trying to drive here is he, he sees this sort of lighter scale of demonic influence on a believer versus what he calls possession. And possession, I don't think he defines here, um, but I know by and large, when people think the word possessed, they're thinking of the modern English usage of the word, not necessarily the historical usage of the word possession, which would probably be important for us to talk about, which maybe, Michael, you can uh, elaborate on somewhat and then also add your own comments on this uh, clip. Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. So on the word possession, I mean, on the face of it, I actually agree with him that the devil cannot possess a Christian, depending on what we mean by that. First Corinthians six, it says, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. So I was purchased by the blood of Jesus. I belong to him. Ephesians one, I'm his inheritance. So, uh, and so I'm, I belong to God. I don't belong to the devil. He's transferred me from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. So all of these scriptures speak to God's ownership, his possession over us. And so God doesn't share me. <laughs> he doesn't share me with the devil. Like, oh, you know, you could have, you know, on Saturdays. <laughs> yeah, so if that's what possess means, joint I custody agree with him. possession. What's that? What's that? It's a joint custody uh, uh, possession. <laughs> joint custody. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So there's no joint custody in the kingdom. We belong to God or the devil, and and so that's that. You're for me or you're against me. Like there's a there's a very clear line there. Uh, but I don't think that's what he's really talking about when he says possession. I think what he's talking about is somebody who is controlled by the devil. Somebody who is uh, who, who just picture Ghostbusters or picture the exorcist or picture one of these movies, eyes rolling back in the head and speaking Latin tongues and all this kind of crazy stuff. I think that's probably what he means. Maybe he probably has in mind the, the Gadarene demoniac and um, some of these extreme examples, dudes living in the graveyard naked. You know, someone is demonized when we should do an episode of like, you might be demonized. Well, that that is the context. <laughs> yeah. He's, it's, it's, it's his teaching on Luke Jeff Foxworthy. That absolutely is your yeah. sign. Like a Jeff Foxworthy, you might be demonized if you're yeah. butt naked, live in a graveyard and scrape your sword. <laughs> yourself with rocks. <laughs> yep. Yep. I think you're there. I think you're there. Think you're there. Bro. So Bro. Ho hold on. Something to note here is the word that we find most often used in scripture in English is possession. That word today does not mean what it's always meant. And, and similarly, like when we use the word awful today, Jack used to give this illustration about how um, when you read old English, you'd see the word awful. And today what we would describe that as something bad. Oh, I feel awful. Or, oh, that's, that's awful. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Whereas in old English, that's actually how you would describe a cathedral. It would fill you with awe. It was awful. And so, whereas it used to be something that would show the majesty of God, or it was a word to describe that, today the word awful means something totally different to de describe something bad. Um, and the, uh, in the same way, I would say that possession has changed, the, the word English word possession has changed meaning over time. Whereas uh, today we say possession is nine tenths of the law, uh, possession means full and complete ownership. Uh, but that's actually not the biblical usage of the word in Scripture. When it's talking about possession, it's talking about a varying degree of influence upon a Christian or affect upon a Christian or even an unbeliever, uh, both and, just a person in general, sorry. 
Um, and so this is why we in uh, the remnant, we use the word demonize or demonization to describe a person because that puts it more on the sliding scale. It is more and it is a more accurate uh, translation of the word demonizomai that you find in the Greek. Yeah, which is interesting. So, so like I don't to dis, to depict uh, to depict demonize like it, the English Standard Version, which is the standard I usually read from. I try to read from them all, but uh, I usually read from. I preach from it. Um, it will normally translate uh, demonizomai as oppressed, demon oppressed. But on I think one occasion. Just with the Gadarene demoniac, it translates the same Greek word as demon possessed. And I'm just going to say, like, hey, I'm no Greek scholar. I don't even pretend to be. Uh, so consider me not that. But uh, I I think that anyone can make the observation and just say, you know, I, I don't think it's the best to translate the word one way in all of these other situations, but just differently, just right here, because this guy just seems like he's got a really bad case of it. Uh, I, I think that actually confounds the matter. Like, I, I think it would be much simpler to translate it as demonized. And then if we did that, then people could still have their debates, but we were at least working from the same word. And so that's the problem here is there's a lot of talking past each other because we're not using the same word. That's why we just prefer the word demonized because that's the truest to the the actual original language and that's how it would have been understand. It's kind of like you got demoned, <laughs> right? You got demonized. And so uh, anyway, so just that little note there, but Miller, yes, I agree with you. I think that the word possession conjures up the wrong kinds of images. Uh, and so we think of it as only that particular extreme case and we say, well, no child of God could experience such a thing. Uh, and, and what I would say is, let's just use the actual word from the Bible. Uh, of course, we, we are making it into English when we say demonized, but we're doing the same thing they do in the Greek. They're just taking a noun and turning it to a verb. We take the noun demon and, ta and change it to a verb demonized. Uh, and so I guess that'd be an adjective. You have been, uh, have it's been. A, it's a verb and an adverb. A verb, a verb. yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, and so we're doing the same thing is my point between the languages. And, uh, and so I think that's just, it, it would help us speak past each other less. Well, let me ask a question uh, from Miller. You know, I, I used, I, I jumped to his use of second Corinthians, um, you know, chapter six, that there's no participation and ownership or no, no, not ownership. There's no participation that, that God's going to have with a demon. Can, would you have another biblical verse? I mean, I, I think I, I used, uh, you know, uh, the Jesus talking to Peter that, that, you know, who do you say that I am? I use that verse in the Gospels. Um, would you have any other kind of rock solid biblical evidence that Christians can, in some way, fellowship with God and fellowship with demons? I mean, is there, yeah, is there you're potentially setting me up. a rock you're, solid verse that says just those things, <laughs> Miller? It, would, would you yeah, here's the that? funny thing in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 19 through 22. It says, I am saying that the idols or food sacrificed to them, do they amount to anything? No. I mean that what the pagans sacrifice is to demons and not to God. So this is about Christians attending pagan festivals where they're eating food that has been very clearly sacrificed to demons. And so he goes on and says, uh, I do not want you to be partners with demons. Now that word partner is an important one. It's uh, koinonia, fellowship, partakers. <laughs> I don't want you to fellowship with demons which is what they were doing, which is why he's correcting them on this. He says, you cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot take part in the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Uh, or are we trying to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we really stronger than he is? The, the point here is that the Christians, at least in the Corinthian church, were actually partaking of demons. They were fellowshipping with demons, which is exactly what... Uh, uh, Chuck Smith is saying can't happen, but it actually was happening, and that's why he's addressing it. And it's not just happening here. You see a lot of other verses in the epistles uh, talking about, hey, I don't want you to be to practice these things. And he mentions uh, perversion, immorality, and greed, and then he says, which amounts to idolatry. So what does that mean then? Um, it does seem that Christians can do these things, and these actually are uh, opening them up to demonic influence on some sort of scale. 
Okay, so uh, Miller, you've talked about the um, Chuck Smith. We, we've kind of, not, not, let's say that we targeted Chuck Smith, but like that seems to be a one of the rising voices in the charismatic space saying that, charisma, uh, that Christians can't be demonized. Now, we this is not an exhaustive study. We haven't like tried to track the historicity of when Christians begin to say that, Chris, that Christians can't be demon possessed, but I would venture to imagine, I'm this is a speculation. Oh, I, I, I think there, somebody has salt. tracked it. I think Hollywood wasn't the first to sort of think these things. A lot of this doesn't come from church history, church fathers, either Antecian or post Nicene or medieval. It all starts after the a good bit after the Reformation and particularly after the French Enlightenment. That's when you start to see a desupernaturalization uh, or a a supernatural uh, blind spot uh, begins to develop in the Western world, and it's that's like a materialistic kind view. of yeah. So historically, the church has actually always believed Christians can have demons, and we're going to show you a lot of both. I mean, we're just going to give you some of the early church fathers here in just a minute, but uh, before we do that, we should go to the AG stuff. Yeah, Roundtree, I, I'm I'm curious. Could you maybe read the the quote from the assemblies? Um, I'm, I'm interested. I've never read their position paper on the subject of being demonized and having been raised in an assemblies church where people said, hey, you can't be demonized. I'd be curious what the official position pa paper is. All right. You got it. Here it is. It says, the conflict between the believer and demonic forces can be understood as a spectrum of demonic influence ranging in the degree of domination over a person's life and in the variety of aspects of life where demonic control has taken place. The impact of demonic powers may be slight and almost undetectable. If one repents, forsakes their sin and carnal activities, resists temptation, call upon the spirit to cleanse and deliver, victory and freedom will be obtained. The extreme influence of the demonic could be called possession, in which a person is controlled by demonic forces who manipulate the individual's body, mind, and spirit for their destructive purposes. This extreme case of demonic control is indicative of continued movement away from and abandonment of a personal relationship with Jesus. The believer should gain victory in the spiritual conflict, but well before this extreme and not be subject to it. While believers will engage in spiritual warfare and will be oppressed, they cannot be possessed by the demonic forces. And then it goes on. With demon possession, the power of Satan takes control of the center of an individual's personality. In such lives, demons can manifest themselves through temporary changes in personality, speech, bizarre physical behavior, physical and mental affliction, and self-destructive tendencies. Okay, so there you go, fellers. What do y'all think? Do you agree? Are you a Miller? How, how is that? How is that different than what Chuck Smith said? Uh, the only difference, well, in this particular quote, I have another one that I, I didn't put in the notes, but um, I don't see much difference here than what Chuck Smith wrote, except for it does. He is talking about Christians uh, being oppressed, and I think a little bit more. Uh, how do I say this? On more of a spectrum is a better way of putting it. Um, with demonic possession, though, I mean, it does seem like he at least defines what he what he sees as possession, and he would say, hey, here's the cases of possession. So he's now sort of differentiating between what oppression and possession looks like. He would probably say oppression looks a lot like, or this person who wrote the position paper of the AG, and AG would agree, um, oppression looks a lot like what Chuck, Chuck Smith described, but here's what possession looks like. And he mentions... Uh, changes in personality, speech, bizarre physical behavior, physical and mental affliction, and self-destruction tendencies. Now, the, the, again, another difference here is that Chuck Smith would say we don't see this often. And if anything, it's usually just mental disease where uh, and as being misdiagnosed by Christians as demon possession, um, whereas, which again, to me, shows some of his ethnocentrism. Um, but here they're saying, well, that, that kind of stuff could also be demonic. Um, that's about yeah. it. Yeah, and I, I think, too, just uh, when he talks about this temporary changes in personality, speech, bizarre, physical behavior, whatever, like, I just don't see a biblical reason to limit that to possession. Like, give me a chapter and verse that says, hey, only if you have a legion of demons living inside of you, making you scrape your wounds, the living butt naked in the tombs, only then will you have crazy manifestations. Uh, it's... It sounds, I don't know, because I, I imagine, I can't imagine every person in the Assemblies of God believes this. I know it's their position paper, but the thing is, if you have if you have a lot of experience with casting out demons, you just won't say that kind of thing, because you will encounter, like, you'll just encounter people who love the Lord and are just, are good people, 
but somewhere along the way got demonized and they exhibit those crazy manifestations. What do you do in that situation? Do you just deny reality in front of your eyes? Are you like, well, they're foaming at the mouth and talking in a strange voice, but I just know this person to be a godly person. So it couldn't be a demon. Let's just call the ambulance. I mean, like, what do you do? Uh, I, I think what you do is you address the spirit is what you do. And, uh, and so I, I don't know, I can't imagine that everyone in the assemblies of God believes that, but to your point, Miller, uh, this came straight from a position paper. So, well, and, and not just this position paper, but, but I've actually been to churches that were AG. They've had me come teach on healing. They wanted me to teach on healing and the miraculous. And I just prepped them on the front end. I said, guys, if you really want to see this stuff, you have to cast out demons. And they're like, well, you know, you don't believe Christians can have demons, do you? And I go, absolutely. The vast majority of people I get set, see, I see get set free from demons are actually Christians because they're willing to repent from their sin. Whereas un, uh, people who are not Christians, they're like, well, no, I love my sin. I don't want to get rid of that. Um, yeah. And the non-Christians don't have a belief in the supernatural or anything. So they're, you know, I, I mean, it'll happen. I mean, Christians will be just very open to receiving that kind of ministry. Uh, right. Non-Christians, not so much. Uh, and, and oftentimes, I'm sure you've experienced this, Miller, someone you're just praying for healing for exhibits like some kind of demonic manifestation. Well, then you Dude. go after it. I mean, I yeah, would, if you get if you pray for a lot of sick people, you're probably going to see somebody manifest at some point. I, and yeah, go ahead, Miller. I got a story. <laughs> uh, here it comes. All right. So I'm in Scotland with Ken. And I'm praying for a Scottish lady. And as I'm trying to figure out what's going on, she just gives me this sort of weird smile. She goes, just looks at me. I'm praying. Everything's normal. And she goes, and I'm looking at her I'm like, something funny? And she's like, no, why? And then she goes right back to it. For those she listening on the audio, of... Miller is making a really strange face. Oh, which, yeah. yeah. Although, I mean, it, that's kind of like his normal face. Go ahead. No. <laughs> uh, my point is but the interesting thing was was her sister was standing there and she looks at her looks at her and goes that's not my sister and i go do you realize that you're making a face sort of a maniacal smile and she's like no she had no idea she was even doing it but her sister looks at her and goes that's not my sister she never makes that face and so now i know what i'm dealing with but th that's the crazy thing is most people who are demonized they may exhibit certain certain behaviors, they may or expressions. They have no idea they're even doing it. It's it's right. it's blinded to them as well. And right. and here's the thing that I know of: there was no other real dramatic manifestations of this demon. And this is what I was trying to say. Sometimes these things are hidden in plain sight. But this woman was a believer in Christ. Um, right. But if yeah. you had had a if you had had a theology that told you it's impossible that this is demonic. You really would have just proceeded and and ignored a demon. Like that's not a right. that's not a good thing to do. Ignoring a manifesting demon is just usually in, unadvisable. It's, so, it's spiritual neglect. It's spiritual neglect. What I would well, say. Spiritual neglect. Now tell me, so you you cast the spirit out, Miller? Actually, I didn't. And the reason why is because um, she didn't want it to go. It was protecting her. So okay. expand on I, that. Let me let me kind of jump in on that because Roundtree, you gave a. Uh, you know an option of like hey you're just going to ignore this demonic manifestation in our in my experience uh, and I'm, again i'm not trying to paint a big broad brush with you know people from the assemblies i have great respect and, um, and love for my pentecostal brothers and sisters out there so n no shade whatsoever um, but i think many of them would say well if a christian can't be possessed and we're seeing this manifestation we wouldn't pretend that this manifestation isn't demonic in fact what we would do is just say well they probably lost their salvation right so the the, the conversation of well you know i i really have confidence that jesus is my savior they'd have a profession of faith but they would say well yeah but many people are gonna go before jesus one day saying lord lord didn't we do these many miracles in your name and he doesn't know them you know they're, they're living in lawlessness they're there's a, they're practicing sin that's the reason they're bound up in demonic activity they're not letting Jesus be their Lord. They're rejecting him as their savior. Uh, they've fallen from grace. They're not Christian. So they, they believe that they're a Christian, but they've been deceived. Uh, they don't really know. Uh, so there really is a demonic activity the, that's where's present. Where's yeah. The, the Chuck Smith crew, and I know this because I've actually had this happen. Um, they would say, well, it's not a demon. It's got to be a mental illness because I know you. I baptize you. You're a Christian. And I say this because I literally had a female show up at my church 
She was a member of a Calvary Chapel. She was saying, I have a demon. I'm positive I have a demon or I'm mentally ill. Because, but, And she goes, I went to my pastor. She said, would you pray for me? I think I have a demon. He says, no, you've got to be mentally ill. I baptize you. You're a believer. I know you're a believer. She says, well, I don't know what to do with what I'm experiencing. Well, she sits down with my wife and I, and sure enough, it is a demon, and we cast it out of her. And it was a very demonstrative uh, exit when it left. Um, so I, I think you do see what, what Michael is saying. That does happen in the Calvary Chapel circles. And I would agree with you in the AG church, they would say, oh, you must have lost your, your salvation. We need to get you saved and baptized again. Yeah, um, well, and... I mean, that's a that's a great point, Miller. That's probably what a, a lot of them would say. And again, love my AG brothers and sisters. Um, I I would say that it seems possible to me that your theology about whether a Christian can be demonized is leading you to make pronouncements over people's eternal salvation in that scenario. Like, what if they actually are saved? Like, what if this is someone who's like, I profess Jesus is Lord. I love him. I follow him. And you can always say, well, they're the Matthew 7 person who who says Lord, Lord, but doesn't actually know him. I, I don't know. I just, I don't like a situation where uh, I'm, I'm forced to just tell somebody you're not an actual Christian, even though you say and act like in every way that I know of that you are. Um, right. So I don't, I don't love that. But Miller, um, come back to the story. So you didn't, can catch, I, you didn't can I want straw I want to yeah. steal man the, the Pentecostal too, just for a second, because yeah. again, I don't think any Pentecostal would look someone square in the eye and go, so you're okay, not you saved. Demon, therefore you're not saved. They would pastorally care for that moment. And they would be like, Hey, so you've got this unrepentant sin that's in your life. That's causing you to be demonized. Would you repent of this sin? And they would probably lead them in a prayer, very similar to one that you, me and, and Miller would lead them in and have them repent of their sin and confess faith in Jesus and pray for them, cast out the demon. And then they would just pastorally kind of instruct and, hey, you need to pursue uh, you know, your faith in Jesus. You need to be devoted to him and faithful living. They would, they would pastorally kind of shepherd them. They wouldn't be like, hey, you lost your salvation. You know, you're damned. Like they would be like, hey, this sin is bad. Don't do it. Uh, and don't continue in sin well, unless something they worse might be thinking it though josh like, they, they're <laughs> they definitely would be it. Like, I, i'm not i'm yeah, not saying i just want to be clear they're not but, pastoring no, that's it. Good. Like, it's not that's like spiritual good. abuse if, i mean yeah. if you if you know how to shepherd a situation you can have say a, a certain theology and still like treat people with kindness and respect so point taken well and, I, and I agree with you for the record uh, you can also have a position that we have, which is that Christians can be demonized. Oh, and by the way, if you believe that, then you're also going to be able to agree with 1,500 years of church history. Uh, conveniently enough. <laughs> conveniently enough. And uh, conveniently enough, we have examples of the universal agreement of the early church fathers on the idea that Christians can be demonized. Anybody who writes on the topic seems to take our position on it. And so for that, let's go with the uh, first quote that I have, uh, which is from Asterius Urbanus. I, I don't know how to pronounce these Latin names. But, AD 232. Uh, yeah, AD 232. Uh, Michael, you want to go and read it for us? Okay. Uh, speaking, he's talking about the Montanists. Um, mm -hmm. He says, there, they, this cult, they say one of those who had been but recently converted to the faith, a person of the name Montanus, when Gratus was pronounced, uh, was proconsul of Asia. He gave the adversary entrance against himself by the excessive lust of his soul after taking the lead. And this person was carried away in spirit and suddenly being seized with a kind of frenzy and ecstasy, he raved and began to speak and to utter strange things. Uh, and to prophesy in a matter contrary to the custom of the church is handed down from the early times and preserved thenceforward in a continuous succession. And among those who were present on that occasion and heard those spurious utterances, there were some who were indignant and rebuked him as one frenzied and under the power of demons and possessed, <laughs> he went ahead and used the word, by the spirit of delusion. Uh, okay, guys, what do y'all think of that quote? Well, is this a really great quote to say that Christians can be demonized? Because like Montanus was like, he was a heretic. Like he denied the Trinity. Like I think you could actually make the case that that guy wasn't a Christian. So let me again, let me try to, let me try to steal man the oh, argument on. here. And but say, that's not, that's not what the early church father is saying. 
they're saying that they know this person, that people saw his conversion. And so that's the record. So we either have to say that their perception of him becoming a Christian was never accurate or that he was not demonized and it's just a mental illness. But do you, But either way, you, what you're doing from the very outset is discounting their perception of, of what was going on with this person. No, I disagree. I think this actually affirms the Pentecostal perspective. And again, I'm not trying to side with the Pentecostals, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm saying, but hear me out. They're saying this guy was a real convert and then he lost his faith because of his, his beliefs and then was demonized. Like that, that actually affirms the Pentecostal position, right? No, what they were saying was that he was a believer he began to prophesy in a fashion because he was demonized. And then after that, he starts creating a cult uh, movement known as the Maltinus. Uh, so it, it, the order here is not the same as you're describing. Oh, uh, okay. I misunderstood the quote too then. <laughs> yeah. All right. Does that makes sense, yeah. Josh. Well, what, what makes it super easy is that it's Latin translated into English, but like old yeah. English, so it makes it really convenient for comprehension. I'm going to put the graphics up with the quote so people can follow along with us. All right, but it gets better. We have other quotations. It's not just him. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, give me I, and this one, is only Miller. just a few. Just a few. Hold on. Okay. Hold on, Miller. Is this one going to prove uh, the Pentecostals right? Also. I hope so. <laughs> no, but I, I that would be honest, guys. That was right. <laughs> was right. <laughs> no, no. Josh is saying, ah, he was preaching heresy, therefore he was no longer a believer. And I'm saying, no, no, no. He became a believer then because he was demonized uh, and never set free from that demon, uh, began to prophesy and then go into a uh, prophesy falsely and lead people into heresy. It was after all of that. Uh, which I actually think can happen today. I know people, yeah. I've seen this kind of stuff happen <laughs> it, where a person confesses Christ, uh, seems very sincere in their faith, but then they get into spiritual gifts and they never quite uh, got set free from demons and they start getting into all kinds of weird delusions. Right. I think some of these other quotes will be clearer because I think what this ends up touching on is one's belief about perseverance of the saints versus you can lose your salvation. And depending on what position you kind of fall into on that, it'll kind of govern how you interpret what's happening in this story. Um, but let's keep reading this one from Tertullian here. Oh, this one's Tertullian, bad, way better. Tertullian, a really solid church father. I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, yeah, go for it. Okay. And, uh, and he was around like a second to third century. He says, why may not those who go into the temptations of the show become accessible also to evil spirits? We have the case of the woman, the Lord himself is witness, who went to the theater and came back possessed. And the outcasting, according when the unclean spirit creature was upbraided with having dared to attack a believer, he firmly replied, and in truth, I did it most righteously, for I found her in my domain. How many other undoubted proofs we have, we have had in these case of persons who by keeping company with the devil in the shows have fallen from the Lord. Okay, so... He clearly says, having dared to attack a believer, and according to Tertullian, the demon says, I had the right because this woman, who was a believer, visited the shows, the theaters. So uh, sounds like he must be talking about like the lewd, just wildly sexual and terrible, like kind of well, bloodthirsty, you know, un yeah, unlike the movies today. Oh, wait. Well, um, anyway. Um, yeah. So people they were actually these. committing acts of violence and idolatry at these theaters as well, just to be clear. And then the other thing about this particular quote not, not is, the woman watching. She was watching, but she was entertained right. by it. She right. was entertained by it. And the demon but says... But the other thing to note here is, is that Tertullian had already set this woman free. He had already cast this demon out of her, and it had come back. And that is the context of this passage. How did she get re-demonized? What gave you the gall or the arrogance to afflict this child of God? Somebody he can quite affirm as in the faith. And he says, eh, she was in my domain. Plain and simple. I do think it's okay. kind of funny. And this is Tertullian. This is not like some kind of off-brand great value no, church father. No. I mean, this is this is like a, a major player in like Nicene articulation of the Trinity. I mean, we're talking about one of the big baddies of you know church fatherdom i mean this this guy's the real deal meaning he's good 
Yeah, right. he's a good. When I say the big baddies, I, I mean, just mean like he's like he's got authority. Like when we when we quote church fathers, we quote Tertullian. I mean, this guy knows what he's doing. So uh, it's it's not just some random off brand church father. I mean, this is like a a real solid. You know, we use this in apologetics when we're debating heresy. Church father. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a solid quote. I, I don't think. I think it's way stronger than the first one to articulate the position that we believe. I'll, I'll say that. Great. Do you okay. want to, uh, Miller, do our next one? Hippolytus sure. Yeah, or this Hippolytus? Is, uh, is it Hippolytus? I don't know how you say his name. Maybe. But this, uh, he was uh, around in 170 AD to 235, and here's what he says. It says, they who are to be set apart for baptism. So these are people who are already confession of faith. It says, they who are set apart for baptism shall be chosen after their lives have been examined. Whether they have lived soberly, whether they have they have honored the widows, whether they have visited the sick, whether they have been acting in well-doing, when their sponsors have testified that they have done these things, then let them hear the gospel. Then from the time that they are separated from the other catechumens, hands shall be laid upon them daily in exorcism. And as the day of their baptism draws near, the bishop himself shall exorcise each of them that he may be personally assured of their purity. Then, if there's any one of them who is not good or pure, he shall be put aside as not having heard the word of word in faith, for it is not possible to, for the alien to be concealed. They who, who are baptized shall fast on Friday and on Saturday. The bishop shall assemble them and command them to kneel in prayer. And then laying his hands upon them, he shall exercise all evil spirits to flee away and never to return." When he has done this, he shall be breathe on their faces, seal their foreheads, ears, and noses, and then raise them up. At the hour set for the baptism, uh, the bishop shall again take another and exercise it. This is called the oil of exorcism. A deacon shall bring the oil of exorcism. Then the presbyter, taking hold of each of those who are about to be baptized, shall command him to renounce, saying, I renounce thee, Satan, and all thy servants and all thy works. And when he has renounced all these, the presbyter shall anoint him with the oil of exorcism, saying, let all spirits depart far from thee. So this is all like sort of Christian pre-baptism formula uh, that was used in the early church. It was a sort of sacrament, right? Sacrament. This is what they did before a person was going to be baptized as they went through several exorcisms. And it seems like daily, it's not like they spent the whole day praying for these people to be exorcised, but that it was a regular thing where these daily things would happen to continue to make sure they got rid of everything that was there before they went into the water of baptisms. And the idea is that by doing this, there's no alien that could be hiding out inside of the life of the believer. Eventually they'll get completely de delivered. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, I've got, I've got so many thoughts about this. You know, what, what if, what if I have a, a viewer right now watching saying now, Michael, I don't see any of those verses in scripture to anoint people on their ears and their nose and their mouth with oil and deliverance oil and get the deacons breathing on their faces, and, and breathing on their face, breathing. You know, I mean, I see Benny Hinn going, you know, but I don't, I don't see anywhere in the Bible other than maybe Jesus breathing on the Benny disciples. Benny Hinn got we, it from we, the we don't, we don't, we don't see any face <laughs> breathing. What's going on? What, why, you know, okay. I, you, you're telling me that this guy believed that, you know, um, you know, through the act of baptism, demons get cast out. Sure. But this seems kind of like he's got a lot of extra biblical stuff in here. Why not just say if all of this stuff is extra biblical, he's just adding extra biblical thoughts to demons, you know, okay, d Christians can be demonized. That's not in the Bible, but neither is all this other stuff. So what if someone's listening to this quote and they just want to kind of like get rid of the whole thing, carte blanche? Well, you got a couple things here. Uh, one, it, it represents that the early church belief that if this was standard church practice, then they clearly believed that Christians could be demonized. That's that's the main point that we're trying to make, not necessarily endorsing all of the other practices. But here's the other thing about it. Um, I would actually say that some of these practices are biblical. Anointing with oil. We see that in James 5. Um, and it does seem to be some connection even there with healing and sins, which would include probably demonic spirits. Um we also see the the anointing of people in oil in all other kinds of manners, not just when, with healing. Um, then when it comes to the breathing on their face, I, I'm not sure. My best guess is John, uh, at the end of John, when Jesus breathes on the disciples, that, that that actually is what he's the early church was practicing. It was similar to what the Lord did himself with the disciples. Uh, but I'm not certain. 
just to be honest. But yeah. but either way, either way, just because you see other practices that you go, well, I'm not used to that. I, I don't see that in scripture. That doesn't mean that this quote doesn't clearly prove that the universal belief in church practice was that they did believe Christians could be demonized. And it was normative practice to exercise Christians uh, before yeah. baptism. Here, here's what's crazy to me. They exercise them daily. Like this yeah. was actually part of the early church's discipleship process. They're like, oh, you're a new believer. Okay, we're going to teach you some systematic theology. They taught them the basic doctrines. We're going to teach you. Uh, we're going to take you through the narrative of Scripture and help you understand that, that basic narrative. They're going to take you through uh, some Christian ethics. And they're going to get all your demons out. Like that's what they did. Clint Arnold wrote, uh, well, a couple of things. One, he wrote an excellent article on this. Uh, I can't remember actually what the name of the article was. It was in Jets. Uh, but the other, I, I think even that was just a compilation that came from his book, Three. I think it's called Three Crucial Questions. Uh, Dr. Clint Arnold, great scholar, and uh, talks a lot about spiritual warfare. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's fascinating. And you know what? It makes sense. According to Ephesians 2, every unbeliever has subjected themselves to their God named Satan. Like, I mean, uh, it doesn't use the word Satan, but it calls him the ruler of the kingdom of the air. All of us followed, followed him at one time before we became followers of Jesus. Well, you think you might get a little demonized if you're following the devil? Even if you're not conscious of it, even if you're not playing with a Ouija board, you're following the devil if you're not following Jesus. And by the way, if you're listening to this podcast, I hope that you would repent of your sins and turn to Jesus. He's the true Lord, and he's way kinder than the devil. And so I'm just looking at it. I'm like, that's actually reasonable. Get all the demons out. And they would do it on the way to baptism. And then at the baptism, they just kind of finish it off. And there's this ancient baptismal formula that still exists in a lot of churches. I renounce Satan and all of his angels. Some of them would say all his angels, all his works. We all do it at pomp. our church. We do, we do it he at our church, it too. I have them renounce too. Satan. It's, all, it's always fun whenever we baptize a kid and the kid's like, I renounce Satan and all his angels. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like stepping right in with church history there. Praise the praise the Lord. Uh so can I can I I'm with Miller on quote from Cyprian? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Because I think I think this one's a good one to kind of wrap up on. I think Cyprian kind of touches on this idea of baptism and denouncing devils. Like you, you mentioned it just now, uh, Roundtree. It says this final uh, this finally uh, in in very fact also we experience that those who are baptized by urgent necessity in sickness and obtain grace are freed from unclean spirits uh, uh, wherewith. Uh, they were previously moved and lived in the church in praise and honor and day by day make more and more advance in increasing in their heavenly grace by the growth of their faith. And on the other hand, some of those who were baptized in health, if subsequent they begin to sin, are shaken uh, uh, by the return of the unclean spirit so that it is manifest that the devil is uh, driven out by uh, driven out in baptism by faith of the believer and returns uh, in the faith afterward, uh, or, or sorry, afterwards shall fail. You know, if their faith fails, this unclean spirit returns back to them. So, like, how Wait, wild is that? That by faith failing, he's referring to sins. He's that's not right. Just saying, that's right. Like, you've 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 uh, walked away from the faith entirely. Like you've denied Christ. He's saying you're stepping back into sin. That's what he means by your faith failing. There, just to be clear, that's important. Mm -hmm. Josh, Jace. <laughs> hey guys we have got to wrap this show up because we've got another show that we are filming on the back end of this uh, i think this is a great conversation to be had uh well, you know launching I from the calvary chapel movement the assemblies yeah. of god those guys um and then going into church history and saying hey look this has been the the mode and belief of christians throughout the ages uh give me some closing thoughts guys before we wrap this program up uh, because we've got to get to another uh program on the back end of this uh what would be some closing thoughts that you would want to leave our audience with Okay. Well, one, I would say next week, I'd love to jump some more into the early church's view of demonization and casting out demons and pull in some more church fathers quotes. Yeah, let's uh, do just a part because two. We, yeah, we'll do a, a part two specifically focused on the early church, uh, just because I think that that's such an important uh, sort of grid through which to see. It's not that the early church got everything right, but people act like we're crazy when we say a Christian can be demonized 
and we're saying then you're calling hundreds hundreds of years of christianity crazy because that was the standard position uh your position is actually the novel position so I, i'd like to show that next week so we'll we'll revisit this you guys and uh and just overall closing thought get the demons out kingdom of god's here <laughs> jesus reigns he reigns in power so yeah, that's it. I think that's my closing thought. Miller, what about you? <laughs> Get rid of devils. Uh, right. The closing thought is, I know that there's probably a bunch of naysayers on this saying, ah, oh, but show us the scriptures. Well, just to be clear, that wasn't the intention of this episode. This episode was really about addressing uh, contemporary views and how does that line up with history. Uh, but if you want scripture, we've done other episodes on this. Can a Christian be demonized? We have uh, multiple episodes where we've talked about this. So please go check in the uh, the video link sp specifically under the playlist. I think spiritual warfare or something like that, Josh, and you might be able to clarify. But we have a yeah. lot of episodes where we talk about do the scriptures defend the position that a Christian can be demonized? And we would say, yes, it, the, the scriptures do. And we've tried our best to prove as much. That's good. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to build a theology on something, uh, experience is going to be probably the bottom of the barrel. You definitely want what does the Bible say? You want to say what has the church been saying throughout history? And then finally, under that, you can say, does my experience line up with what the scriptures clearly articulate? What has been said throughout the church age? Uh, and uh, uh, does this line up with my, my personal experience? That would be the kind of, uh, if we're going to create an apologetic argument for why we believe Christians can be uh, oppressed, possessed, we would go to that kind of tiered system. We would encourage you to approach that tiered system the same way. Uh, what do the scriptures say? What does church history say? And does that line up with your own personal experience? We'd hope uh, that that would encourage you as we're kind of walking through history. Uh, and then maybe, you know, push yourself to be in dark spaces. Go to places where the oppressed are and see if your experience lines up with it. So thank you so much for tuning in this program. Uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, hit the subscribe button, like this video, maybe share it around to those who are out there in your space uh, who you think are demonized. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much for tuning into this program, and we'll see you next uh, Monday and Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Also, I'd really encourage you, check out the conference at remnantconferences.com. Spots are going quick, and you might not have uh, a ton of time to register, even at the time of taping of this video. We don't know how many people are going to register, so I would really encourage you, go check it out. Register remnantconferences.com. A link can be found in the description of this video.